Welcome back to Unit 2, International Climate Governance. In this lecture, you will learn which actor coalitions have formed in the international climate negotiations. Our speakers, Paris Borzelli and Tobias Nielsen, are both from the Department of Political Science at Lund University in Sweden. We are now connected to Lund University. Paris Borzelli is Associate Professor at the Department of Political Science at Lund University. His major research and teaching interests include global climate governance, institutional complexity and political theory. Tobias Nielsen is a doctoral candidate at the Department of Political Science at Lund University. He has published on the UN climate negotiations, in particular on the new political groups in the climate negotiations. So, Fari and Tobias, which actor coalitions are out there and who are the new kids on the block? Hello and welcome. United Nations climate negotiations will take place in France in December this year and we hope for a new climate agreement to be adopted in Paris. Now, like in Tour de France, the 190 plus countries do not ride on their own. They are part of teams or political groups that unite over certain perceptions or interests. But unlike Tour de France, it is not about who finishes first. It's about getting all of these teams over the finish line. For over two decades, we have seen the usual suspects and alliances, the EU, the US, and the G77 for developing countries. Now, over the past year, some new groups have emerged that may change the game in one way or the other. Tobias, you have researched and published on this. Tell us a bit, what is going on here? Well, indeed, Fari. There has been some considerable shifts going on. But you know what? Uh, before I tell you about the, group, the new groups, um, let's have a quick uh, historical look at some of the old groups and one of the central fault lines that separate them. That uh, makes sense, Tobias. I took the second step before the first one. So yes, please, give us a history lesson. Well, first of all, we can group them according to the so-called Annex Division. In the United Nations Climate Change Convention, the UNFCCC, there's a principally a sort of classification of countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Annex 1 being the developed, primarily northern countries. Uh, the groups here include the EU, uh, the umbrella group, which includes the US mm -hmm. and others. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, you have the non-Annex 1 uh, parties, which are developing countries, primarily located in the global south. So you have the G77 plus China, which mm -hmm. you already mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, they represent most of the non-Annex 1 countries. You have the least developed countries. You have an alliance of small island states, the African group of negotiators, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. Now, the division between Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 reflects how the world looked like in 1992 when the UNFCCC was adopted. Many, especially developing countries, are actually part of more than one group. Now, one major thing that, that, that divides the Annex, uh, sorry, the Annex 1 and the non-Annex 1 uh, countries, the North and the South, if you like, is the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities. capabilities. Wow. Sorry. That, that's a very long bureaucratic term. Uh, it is, yeah, and there's a, a lot more of them in the negotiations. Um, but this principle of common but differentiated responsibilities is one of the most defining principles of the UNFCCC negotiations. And it is invoked in virtually all major decisions and instruments adopted by the UNFCCC, including the Kyoto Protocol, mm -hmm. and it's going to be one of the core parts of the Paris Agreement. Yeah. Now, to give you an example, only Annex 1 countries or developed countries were obliged to reduce their emissions under the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which, as it turned out, was one of the key reasons the US did not sign up to it. Um, for some, this principle is a safeguard for developing countries that do not have the same capacity, either financially or critically, to reduce their emissions. Mm -hmm. Also, they don't have the same historical responsibilities that developed countries have for climate change. Now, on the other hand, some observers hold that e emerging economies can use this principle as an excuse for inaction or for gaining an economic advantage over developed countries as they do not face the same restrictions that they do. 
Mm -hmm. So you are basically saying that a lot of the deadlock in climate negotiations goes back to these original fault lines between North right. and South right. and how these different countries view mm -hmm. the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, something must have happened recently to be as because let's let's not kid ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. The responsibility debate has been haunting UN climate negotiations, every meeting room right. thereof, right. over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So what has changed recently to bring up all these new groups? Enlighten us, to be. Well, um, the recent changes uh, go back to the failure of the climate summits in Copenhagen mm -hmm. in 2009, mm -hmm. uh, when we were expecting to reach a global deal on climate change, the one we're now hoping to get in Paris. Now, since Copenhagen, we've seen at least seven new political groups emerge. Seven groups. Exactly, seven, yeah. At the UNFCCC negotiations. Now, some of these are developing countries, groups that argue for a dynamic interpretation of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, now, here the focus is on respective capacity rather than differentiated responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is, a, this is sort of different as it promotes more of a sense of shared responsibility. Uh, as such, reducing emissions is not only the responsibility of the rich, uh, but all those that have the capacity to mitigate should do so. I see. So you are saying that the question of allocating responsibilities is still the main question about which these groups are, are vying, mm. but that the debate has become more, more nuanced. Mm. You could say a differentiated debate about differentiated responsibility? Uh, well, yeah, you could do so. Um, when you look at some of these new groups, we find that some present slightly different perspectives on the key problems and solutions mm -hmm. when it comes to allocating mm -hmm. responsibility. Now, on the one hand, some groups fight for the differentiated responsibilities as an absolutely fundamental part of the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. And they've mm -hmm. been very vocal on this issue and very clear in their concerns. Uh, if we look at the LMDC, the like-minded developing countries, which includes 30 countries, including China, India, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, uh, the, and the DRC, um, they argue that the increasing risk of climate change is caused by lack of action from developed countries, which continue to backtrack on their UNFCCC commitments. Now, the solution, according to the LMDC, is that developed countries should continue to assume a heavier burden in efforts to better combat climate change. Mm -hmm. Now, they refuse to reinterpret the principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capacity. They argue that it is a lack of implementation by developed countries that is the fundamental problem. And efforts to reinterpret this principle are, uh, is damaging to negotiations, as it would take the pressure off developed countries to live up to their commitments. Now, they argue that had developed countries actually lived up to their original commitments, to reduce emissions, we would be in a very different situation today. Mm -hmm. Right, so still this is not so new, right? What this LMDC group is saying is pretty much what we know from the G77 also over the last two decades, right, right. this idea of an umbrella view mm. uh, to which all major developing countries mm. can align to, or all right. developing countries can. So what about other groups that might challenge this view? Okay, well, uh, one group that does this is called ILAC. So the Independent Association of Latin America and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Now they can to some extent be seen as an alternative developing country group to the LMDC. Now key countries here include Peru, Mexico, Colombia, but interestingly, not Brazil nor Argentina. Uh -huh. Now alternatively to the LMDC, the central problem here is the graveness and the proximity of severe climate change and the impact this has on developing countries in mm -hmm. particular. Uh, but importantly for them, they want action to happen faster. So IDAC presents the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective uh, uh, capabilities as relevant, especially in terms of equity. But in its current form, so they argue, it has unfortunately led to a stalemate between developed and developing countries which in turn has contributed to the lack of progress mm -hmm. in the negotiations. So the solution to the problem for ILAC is that developing countries, when possible, should not hide behind the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective uh, capabilities, but instead assume 
responsibility both at home and abroad mm -hmm. to demonstrate leadership on climate change and stimulate the negotiations. Makes sense. Right. So even though developing countries did not make uh, a major contribution to the emissions of greenhouse gases historically and mm -hmm. to climate change, um, they can make a substantial contribution to recovering the balance of the world. So the ILEC narrative promotes an understanding uh, of climate change challenge as a shared responsibility uh, and as a future climate change regime based on commitments from all parties. So altogether, Fabi, looking ahead at negotiations in Paris at the end of 2015, we find ourselves in a somewhat different situation than was the case in Copenhagen in mm -hmm. 2009. Uh, the failure of that climate summit in Copenhagen was partly explained by a significant gap between developed and developing countries. And mm. as we have indicated, this gap is no longer as clear cut. Mm -hmm. And as a result, this may facilitate a more promising outcome in Paris uh, with the possibility for an increased cooperation across the North-South divide. Great to be as well. There's some reason for hope, I'll read out mm -hmm. of this. In any case, mm -hmm. thanks a lot for this insightful view about the old and the new political groups. Right. Well, let's hope that this time in Paris, all of these groups can cut a sensible deal. They don't right. disappoint us as they did in Copenhagen and they get over the finish line. Right. Thanks a lot. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you.